On today's episode, we go into retention marketing strategy fundamentals that actually scale up e-commerce businesses. So welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast. I'm your host, Kune Campbell. In today's episode, we are talking to Jess Chan, founder, CEO of Longplay, a full service e-commerce email and lifecycle marketing agency and Backbone, a platform designed to streamline email marketing for small e-commerce teams. This is Jess's second time on the show. And if you know what it takes to get on this pod twice, you know that Jess is a truly special person or guest. Now, Jess is one of the top retention marketing experts I know out there and someone I've introduced to numerous e-commerce teams. To find out more about her, I encourage you to go back to season seven, episode 23 of this podcast, which I recorded just about 10 months ago. The focus of that episode was Jess's background in marketing as a CMO in e-commerce space and consumer brand space, as well as a deep dive into lifecycle and email marketing for e-commerce. Today's episode, however, is special because Jess has now created Backbone, which is a turnkey e-commerce solution for smaller e-commerce teams that essentially replaces the planning and structure of typical email and lifecycle marketing agency renders to smaller e-commerce brands. I asked Jess to specifically cover retention marketing as a strategy that sits well above lifecycle and email marketing, which according to Jess encompasses email marketing, direct mail, repeat purchase apps, loyalty programs, quizzes, post-purchase communication, and even cross-selling. We also go through her eight essential email marketing flows for brands doing over just 1 million um, in revenue a year or less, rather not over, but 1 million a year in revenue or less, required to grow to about like 10 million plus um, a year. Now, one more thing, Jess has put together a D2C email flow foundations course on Gumroad. I've linked to the show notes and I think any brand owner doing 1 million or less, 1 million in, in revenue or less should really study this and integrate right away. Find out more about this in either the show notes of this episode or on 2xecommerce.com. So if you want to gain valuable insights into retention marketing from an expert with a proven track record, then pay attention. So without further ado, let us get started. Hey Jess, welcome to the 2 Commerce Ecommerce Podcast. I am so excited to be here. I'm excited too. And this is the second time you're, you're coming on the podcast. Last time was like last year, right? It was, yeah, September of 2022, I think. Yeah, it feels like an eternity ago, um, but I think you're right. It's probably last year. A lot has happened since then. And um, I really wanted to give the audience a refresher on the fundamentals of of email marketing and, and retention. Um, so it's lovely to have you back on and um, yeah, great stuff. Yeah, so excited to dive into retention. I think it's so much more relevant of a topic uh, in 2023 as it was compared to, you know, back in 2020, 2021 when acquisition was going really well. Um, whereas, you know, we're really noticing just acquisition channels like Facebook, TikTok, Instagram are becoming a little bit more competitive, a little bit more challenging. Um, because of that, we're really seeing a, a huge focus for the some, D2C e-com as an industry on the importance of retention. So um, super excited to dive into all of that with you. Amazing. Amazing. So in in retention, what would you say are the macro trends you're seeing in you know in in in, in the space in, in this space now um, in, in 2023? Yeah, I think uh, what we're seeing really is the importance of having multiple retention channels as well as a holistic retention strategy. And what I mean by, by that is D2C e-com as an industry is definitely just hitting its mature stage. I think last year there was a lot of like, the sky is falling, we're gonna go into a recession, all this stuff that's happening. I don't, it's definitely getting tougher, um, but I don't think we're going to a full recession right now. I think what's really happening is the D2C e-com industry is getting more mature. You know, there's, there's a lot more competition. You, we're no longer in a state of the industry where you can just launch an ad and we print money and everything's amazing. 
we really have to work for our success now in the D 2 C e-com space. And because of that acquisition is kind of getting a little bit more saturated, you know, like it's still a hundred percent working, but we need to look to other areas of business to really be able to build a profitable, scalable, sustainable D 2 C e-com business. And retention mm -hmm. has become a, an important part of that. You know, when acquisition is becoming more, tough it's like we can't just grow by acquiring new customers we're going to actually grow by retaining our existing customers keeping them for longer um and really getting more like a higher ltv out of our existing customers and that's really where a holistic retention strategy needs to exist and i think you know two years ago when we, everyone was talking about retention in dd D2C e-com, all we were talking about was like email. Like, if, are you sending out emails? If you do, you have a retention strategy. And maybe if you're like really, really, really like optimizing everything, you have some SMS going out as well. Um, whereas mm -hmm. now with retention strategy, having email is the absolute basic minimum. Mm -hmm. um, and SMS is also kind of right up there in terms of you should have a basic SMS program going. But there's so much more to retention than just specific channels, you know? Um, I think a lot of par large part of it is trying things like direct mail uh, to maintain customers, loyalty programs, um, actually having a uh, strategy to reduce subscription churn or upsell your customers to, to a subscription product. Um, uh, platforms like Tapcart, uh, platforms like Rello or Repeat to help with your cross-sell strategy and your upsell strategy. Um, so there's just a lot more that needs to happen on the retention side and really thinking about how do you retain your customers by cross-selling them, upselling them, winning them back? Um, how do you build loyalty programs? How do you get them to refer customers? And that goes beyond just marketing on a specific channel like email. There's a lot to unpick there with regards to, to, to all of the elements. Um, and you, you mentioned a lot, you, you mentioned loyalty programs, cross-selling, you know, along with SMS, email, and um, specific strategies to reduce churn for subscription businesses, that's a lot. I was at a private event, e-commerce event. Um, it was a, like a private dinner um, a, a few few days ago. And um, most of the, the merchants there were in the wine industry. And I posed a question there around, um, you know, whether subscriptions played a huge role. And they were like a resounding yes. But the one thing they, they said that has changed in 2023 as compared to, to years prior is that, um, order value has actually gone up, not only as a result of inflation, but um, as a result of people really want, wanting to relish the, you know, just the, 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 the purchases. But the one thing they've re realized was that um, frequency has gone down. So if they were getting 6x frequency, you know, every 12 months, it's, it's 4x or 5x. Um, even though AOV has gone up, and they're just trying to, that, that's that been a major challenge with regards to, to, to frequency. Now, if we zoom out um, at long play and backbone, you guys have, you're privy to a lot of data. What are you seeing in that frequency bit? And then after that, we'll jump into the specific, you know, channels within a retention marketing strategy. Yeah, um, that's a great question. What we are noticing um, is, a high level trend is one is definitely getting more challenging just to get repeat purchases and subscription upsells um in general i think you know two years ago everyone was a little bit more trigger happy in terms of starting a subscription whereas customers are a little bit more hesitant these days so it takes a little bit more brand loyalty to build up to it um that being said what we have noticed is that for example when we look at a brand's data we might notice that the number of people who go from making a single purchase to making a second purchase has gone down and it's a little bit more challenging but at the same time, we've noticed that people who've made a second purchase and go on to make a third purchase has actually gone up. Or people who've, gone, who've made a third purchase who go on to make a fourth purchase is actually going up. So what we're noticing is like we're, we're getting potentially like higher AOV purchases on that first purchase, but getting them from the first to second purchase is a little bit more challenging. Getting them up to a subscription is a little bit more challenging, but also people are a little bit more sticky once you do mm -hmm. get them past that initial hurdle of like making that second or third purchase or getting them on a subscription. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, this is going to be so dependent on the industry or types of products or types of customers. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a general trend that we are noticing. There's a little bit more stickiness, like a little bit more brand loyalty, but it is harder to earn that, that brand loyalty. Okay, so so my, my, my theory from that is purchase one is more like a trial. Do I like this experience or not? Um, so 
they they churn out they so the ones who churn from one to two just don't like the experience and and they they move on it might even be price they might be price sensitive they might you know i don't know they, they, there are many many decisions for them not to make that second purchase but purchase two seems to me like a vote of confidence on the liking of the experience and so the likelihood so they're more vested they're more invested into that experience and so they go two three four and um to infinity i guess exactly and at that that purchase from one to two is really where most a lot of the initial like retention efforts is like best spent um and we find a lot of brands miss out on the post-purchase experience where the post-purchase experience is not just like hey thanks for buying like that's that that used to be what post-purchase nurture was right it's like hey we sent them a thank you email we have a post-purchase nurture strategy um really your post-purchase nurture strategy should be around how do we prevent refunds how do we get them super excited for the product how do we educate them on how to use the product how do we set expectations um how do we actually educate them on using the product regularly and also painting the picture of like hey if you use our product consistently for a month here are some benefits you can expect so and also potentially driving word of mouth there's so much more to post-purchase nurture strategy i think i actually tweeted about this um recently because i'm like why is no one talking about post-purchase nurture strategy if your post-purchase nurture it before they get the product right after they order is probably one of those critical parts of your retention strategy for ongoing purchases to avoid having okay. to win back a customer and no one talks about that part okay so since no one's talking about post nurture strategy <laughs> yeah. let's let's break it down to, to for, for the audience um i i guess it's it's a combination of um like physical interactions you know with with the product and then you and, and messaging um so what message I'll, I'll leave it to you to to sort of break break it down okay yeah um so one of the thought practices that we we love to have our team go through is essentially the question of hey if someone buys your product one time and they don't come back for a second purchase what are like 20 reasons that they might not have come back and that's a really good start to just building a post-purchase nurture strategy so for example let's take the case of like a pet food brand let's say it's um they bought some new dog food for their for the dog um they, they bought a bag and they didn't come back in like 60 days to buy a second bag like what are 20 different reasons so one could be like the dog just wasn't wasn't willing to eat the food like just didn't like it um it was too expensive maybe they bought it and they just like totally forgot about it and it's like sitting in a shelf somewhere because they pre-bought it and they haven't used it yet because they're still using their current bag of dog food um maybe they're like um hey it's pretty good but like is it really worth the price you know i could get a slightly cheaper one um and it's probably about the same maybe they're like it's a little bit inconvenient like now to remember to reorder i'd rather walk down the street to the dog food space so like whatever those whatever those ideas are and from there, you can then backtrack into like what storyline or what education or what material, what do they need to hear in order to avoid those objections. So it can sometimes be as simple as having like a CX team member reach out in your post-purchase nurture strategy. That's one that we really love from an email and SMS side of things. It's like, just write like a plain text email that's automated, but feels like it's coming from your CX team member that's like checking in with them. Um, so maybe- would you, would, you, would you automate that? like yeah random. we would automate everything okay um you can just you you don't even have to make it random you can just put it into your post nurture flow so okay. you would just have like a hey it's jenny from brand you know just wanted like i saw that you bought this product like two weeks ago just want to check in make sure you know how to like feed it to your dog and like integrate this new dog food into their diet um something to, it's more so like writing it from a tone that feels very natural um mm -hmm. maybe they need education on how to uh, incorporate like shipped dog foods because you know there's an acclimation period uh, maybe they need some tips on like hey maybe you can add some toppers to this dog food uh, if your dog doesn't like these flavors and also maybe they just need to really paint the picture of like here's how your dog's health is going to improve month one month two month three month 12 of using this product and get them bought into the longer term strategy uh, maybe that's through testimonials of customers who have fed uh, their dog, your dog food for six months and like differences they've seen. So the big thing really is remembering like the sales process does not stop after they've made that first purchase. It's not like, wow, they made a first purchase. Now we're just going to thank them. Then we'll resell them again when they're ready to make a second purchase. No, the sales process continues from the moment that they made a first purchase 
all the way until you make a second purchase. I love that. I love that the, the sales process continues. It, it, it's an ever, and it's like a reinforcement. It's, it's, it, it's a reinforcement. You need to keep on letting them know, you know, the benefits they're getting or they, they, they expect to get from the product. So they look for the benefits because typically as human beings, we, we, we have so much success, but we look at that one thing. We're just wired to look at the, the things you can fix, right? So, so the negatives. So if we amplify those positives, they'll look for those positives and, um, you know, they start to see the value and utility, right? Exactly. I love, I love exactly how you put that, which is like, give, like help them look for what you do best. Um, it's like, if you mm -hmm. notice like, Hey, your, your dog's coat is going to get shinier, like just planting that seed. They'll probably see that shinier regardless whether it does or doesn't immediately, but like play into the placebo effect, you know, as a marketer. Um, yeah. and it doesn't necessarily have to be like supplements, right? Cause obviously that's a little bit yeah. easier of an example in terms of benefits, but even like, out, like clothing companies, if someone's buying a piece of clothing, show them like five different ways, five different outfits that they can create with that, that one top, you know, there's like, get them to like wear your stuff regularly. And I, like how I'm thinking about it is like, if I'm, if I bought a shirt, it feels amazing. I'm excited about it. Um, but now I have five ways to wear it. I'm wearing it a little bit more often. People are like, wow, where'd you get that? I'm talking about your brand more often. And then also that's going to enforce that. I'm like, wow, I've got like some really good outfits and compliments from like products from this mm -hmm. brand. I'm going to go mm -hmm. shop again a little bit more. Um, so it's all these like little things, um, where there's really no downside, just continue, continue selling. Um, don't, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 you can no longer a, a, approach retention marketing as like transactional thing mm. it's really about nurturing the relationship mm -hmm. okay so so i really like the bit on on the post-purchase nurture strategy really really powerful stuff um another thing I, you you pointed out was loyalty programs um what what's your take on loyalty programs um and best practices to integrate it to maximize retention and lifetime value yeah great question um i think one of the i'll start the other way i think one of the biggest mistakes brands make with uh loyalty programs is that like they set up the program and then they maybe launch it but it usually just lives as like a little thing on the footer of their website and like maybe the most like die hard fan will find that loyalty program for themselves but the real value of a loyalty program is really integrating it throughout your retention strategy so let's just take uh, email marketing and, and a loyalty program you should be incorporating your loyalty program in your welcome flows in your post-purchase nurture flows in your abandoned cart flows um, so really about how do you get people bought into the loyalty program itself um, but also how do you use the rewards and the points as different modes of retention so for example rather than doing hey 20 percent off for site wide you can do like 2x points um, so things like mm. that the loyalty program gives you these mechanisms to be able to incentivize purchases while also not overly discounting your brand. Um, so you're not doing 20% off all the time. Two X rewards points still feels like a good deal for your for your diehard fans um, mm -hmm. and, and incentivizes them without having to like cheapen your brand constantly. Um, also making sure you're actually reminding brand customers to use their loyalty points. And I think the big thing with loyalty points is like it can create this level of FOMO of like, hey, you have like $10 worth of loyalty points uh, sitting here. If you don't use it, that's like $10 wasted. But they're probably not gonna make a $10 order. They're probably gonna make a $30 order, $40 yeah, order. So how do you use your loyalty program to actually just jumpstart that, that purchase process? Um, and I think that's really where we see brands missing out with loyalty programs. Like it needs to be integrated into your retention strategy. It can't just be slapped on. Of like, hey, we have loyalty program. Here's some points. You should join, and that's usually where it lives um, for for most companies. And and would you use um, channels like SMS to sort of remind them because it's it's quite it, it's quite um, refreshing and reassuring to know okay I've got one hundred unit one hundred points of my loyalty it's worth ten dollars. Do you think SMS is a really good sort of um, nudge channel? To, to 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 communicate you know um your their, their loyalty status with with them or would you just stick to email for sure honestly it should be everywhere like email sms 
Um, I've seen some brands do a really good job of actually having it as like a custom thing on the website, like a banner and things like that. Um, that's more personalized. Mm-hmm. That's a little bit more like heavy coding. Um, but treating your loyalty program really as its own, like it's its own thing where it gets pushed in all these different channels, you know? Um, and I think you also brought up a really great, important point of messaging with loyalty points, which is like, don't just say, Hey, you have a hundred loyalty points, translate it to a way that makes sense with them. It's like, Hey, you have $10 or you've earned a, you know, you've earned a free t-shirt with your loyalty, pro- with your loyalty points. Like we are, you have a free t-shirt waiting for you, um, on your next purchase, really bringing it back to like, what is a tangible dollar value or even item mm. that they can claim. Um, and when we talk about loyalty programs, I always bring it back to like the arcade, um, Arcade now, it's just like you want to feel like a kid at an arcade where you're like, I have like all these arcade tokens. Like I get to buy a pencil. Like I get to buy a rubber bouncy ball. Um, like sure. bring uh, bring that type of mentality back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for for the winnings, really for the winnings. Yeah. yeah. From that mentality. <laughs> yeah, that 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 makes that makes a, a a ton of sense. So my question, my my next question is, what brands, in your opinion, what brand, in your opinion, is executing loyalty programs well, like excellently, not just well beyond excellent and why do you think they're they're seeing such success yeah um so dr squatch was actually a brand we worked with for a pretty extensive amount of time i think like probably three years uh now and um and we're no longer working with them they're they're, they're pretty huge at this point um but we were working on their loyalty program pretty in depth and that we've seen them continue scaling that their program and it and again it's really their program works well because it's so integrated into the marketing strategy so when they have a new product launch, they might do the typical product launch, but also early access might get um, extra loyalty program points. Or like if you join the loyalty program, you get early access to two points uh, or sorry, you'll get early access to products. Um, they'll run a lot of promotions with integrating like bonus points into the actual like, promotion strategy. Um, so they're really great at using product launches to drive people to join their loyalty program and also vice versa. They're really great at using their loyalty program to drive customers to purchase new products. Um, They'll use loyalty programs to boost the strategy on like cross selling. So for example, if you bought product A and we want you to buy product B, that's like two X the points you get from trying product B. So again, it's really about, it's another mechanism for incentivization of people to either buy more, retain their customers, whatever those things are. Um, rather than it just being like slapped on separately. I think they do a really fantastic job of that. Um, Frank Body, I also really love their mm-hmm. loyalty program as well. Um, and I think they do a really good job of like tying the incentives to uh, rewards that their customers really care about. And also just like making it very like, it feels VIP. Um, like it feels like there's these different tiers into the loyalty program and you're getting like more and more integrated into their brand. Um, and they also have a really strong, like community built brand as well. Um, so those are probably yeah. the top two, um, D to C brands I think are really doing a good job with the loyalty yeah. program. It's very top of mind. That's interesting. That's interesting. And then how do you tear out as in fundamentally, so say we're, we're a $1 million brand and our next base camp is we want to sort of hit five to 10 million in, in revenue and we know retention is the clear pathway to 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 to, to, to achieving our result. now when we're tackling this loyalty program layer in in our retention marketing strategy how many tiers do you think work um you know um vip silver gold how would you tear it up at its most fundamental without getting too too complicated yeah it's a good question um so i I would start off with three tiers um i wouldn't overcomplicate things so like tier one is just anyone who comes in they start at tier one um maybe tier two is like they've earned a certain number typically just you've earned a certain number of points and then tier three is you've earned more points um and typically the difference between the tiers should be like how many points you receive on each purchase um but also again depending on your brand it could be like early access to new product launches um exclusive access like certain promotions or limited edition drops things like that um we've seen uh brands who have like a very strong brand presence using using like swag as a incentive between different tiers so it it really depends on what your customers really care about your customers care more about savings 
then maybe 2 extra points and a discount code works best. If you really have a strong brand, like a strong community, early access, VIP, um, and swag could work a little bit better than extra points. Yeah, swag um, is so a good thing, yeah. So, so you got to yeah. earn. My thing is like with D2C Ecom, you got to earn the right for your swag to matter. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of brands, like they throw the tote bags and things like that. But like, if, you, if you haven't built it up a strong enough um, brand presence, um, it, it doesn't matter. So brands who could use the econ brands like Liquid Death, Dr. Squatch, like they've earned the right for their swag to be like valuable. Um, and that, that's always really cool to watch from the outside as well. Um, and I think the other difference too, between like a $1 million brand trying to get to five to 10 million too, is like, don't overcomplicate it. Um, a lot of brands try to do too much at once with retention, the same way that they try to do too much at once with acquisition. So with mm-hmm. retention, the same strategy is like you need to lock down one channel first and then continue expanding and continue integrating rather than doing email and doing SMS and doing a loyalty program and doing a mobile app and all this stuff. And none of it is done correctly, which is typically what we see. It's like you're kind of doing email marketing, but you're only sending, you have like three flows set up and like some campaigns and you're also trying to manage your SMS as well. And you also just built out a loyalty program, but that loyalty program isn't really integrated into your strategy. You're just spread too thin. Um, and with retention, typically the order is like, get your email marketing locked down in a machine first, then add an SMS, get that integrated into your email. So now you have email and SMS working as like a machine Then you can start layering in things like direct mail, um, repeat purchase apps. Then you can layer in things like a loyalty program, referral program. Um, then you can layer in quizzes. So, um, again, doing too much at once is just as bad as not doing it at all. Okay, which brings us into the the world of email marketing. Um, for those of you who don't know, those those of you who are not aware, um, Jess has put together a, a a program. It's it's like a course. Um, what's what's a course platform again? It's very popular. It's on Gomroad. 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 I, I will link to it in the show notes. It's called D T C Flow Foundations, and <laughs> it's incredible. Like it is a it's essentially a standard operation, you know, um, you know, procedures doc that you can give to, to, to your team, um, to deploy email marketing. And I want us to speak to it because, um, there's certain strategies, obviously without giving too much, <laughs> the, the entire thing, but the, the, the certain fundamentals you have to get right in your email strategy. So do you want to just run down the the essential flows? This is outside campaigns that are like, you know, blast essentially. Um, so the essential flows um, for, for any consumer brand, you know, owner listening um, that they need to have in their email flows, in their, in their email yeah. setup. Yeah, for sure. And um, kind of to, on um, why we built this flow, in the, or why we built this flow guide in the first place, one of the most important like principles when we talk about retention strategy is like where is the highest ROI to be found in terms of like your time to effort. Um, and with when email when we talk about email marketing, most people jump to email campaigns first because they're like, yeah, like this is just what we talk about. You know, we got promotions, we got product launches, we got seasonality. But the truth is if you really think about it, spending time on email campaigns is great, um, but it's a slightly lower high, lower ROI in the sense where you have to build it, you send it once and you gotta keep doing it every single week. And we always say like when you're just getting started with email marketing um, and you're trying to grow your e-com brand, focus on flows first. Like just sit down for like one week, just build out all of your flows and that's going to be your automated revenue. And that's really why we built this D2C Flow Foundations Guide. And the big uh, the big flows that are, are covered in this guide are that are the most critical is your welcome flow, your browse abandonment flow, your add to cart flow, your abandoned cart flow. Um, and those are all, all going to be around converting more website visitors into uh, actual customers. Then you have your post purchase structure flow, which we've talked about extensively, your cross sell mm-hmm. flow, uh, your replenishment flow, as well as your win back flow. So all of those flows together essentially cover er- every area of your customer journey to convert more traffic uh, to first time purchasers, to nurture your first time customers to come back, as well as increasing your repeat purchaser rate. Um, and those are the absolute basics. So we actually built this flow guide um for our internal team so this was actually built from from me personally when i was trying to get out of the day-to-day of the agency where like we need to train all these email marketers on like how we approach email marketing 
um, for for long play, and we couldn't really find like a good email course out there that we felt like really was aligned with what we wanted to deliver to clients. So this was actually all built internally like three years ago. Um, mm-hmm. And we've obviously updated and grown it since then. Um, but this was the first year that we've decided to like release it publicly. Um, and it was really coming from a place of like, we would have all these brands come in that were a little bit too small for an agency, but we're like, you just need these basic, like just, just take exactly. a week, build these things out and this will set you guys up for success. Exactly. It, it's like working with, you know, with, with, with a, a performance marketing agency that, um, you know, um, essentially scales businesses. They don't, because of, first of all, their price point, um, they're not necessarily attractive to, 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 to startups or, you know, brands at a certain revenue threshold. So, um, they expect you to have reached a certain level of scale and then they'll, 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 they'll sort of scale that success, you know, with, with their skill sets. And it's the same thing here where, you know, you equip them with the fundamentals, you know, these, these flows, um, with, with email and SMS. And then, um, they're at this level where retention marketing is generating, you know, X amount of, of revenue for their brand and they can afford you and you can work and really, really take them to, to the next level. Exactly. Okay, so. So with regards to, I really want to speak to all of them that there are about eight um, flows. Um, one, one is the welcome. The other is a browser, browser abandonment flow, add to cart. Um, then you have the, the abandonment cart flow, post purchase, replenishment, cross sell, win, win back and all that. So with the, with, with a welcome flow, is it a one size fit? What are the first principles to, to incorporate in a welcome flow? That's a great question. And that's kind of one of the, I guess, foundations of this guide is most of the time when you're Googling, like, how do I build a welcome flow for my D2C e-com store? You either get two things. One is you get a list of like 21 welcome flow examples to inspire your next welcome flow campaign, right? And it's like, this isn't super helpful. Like I don't need, there's so much info out there. The second side of it is like a bunch of email templates where it's like, here are the five like flow or five emails for your welcome flow. But the truth is like every brand is a little bit different. Um, so with this guide, it's like, because it was really built for internal training purposes, we actually walk you through how to think about building a welcome flow that's custom for your brand. And also giving you some of the like basic elements that should always be in a welcome flow, whether it's like a, an offer or like just guidelines on how a header should look, things like that. Um, so mm-hmm. we're thinking about building a welcome flow. The first step really is to think about like, what does your customer need to know about your brand in order to want to make a purchase from you. What are those core value props? Um, and then we can build a welcome flow first email around that. So it could be your product quality um, and how it's sourced. It could be how many influencers have like used your product. Like what is the main thing, main reason that a customer comes to buy from you? That should be your first welcome flow email. Then it might be, what are some common ob- objections that customers have to buying from you maybe it's price maybe they're worried about the quality maybe they're worried about like does it work for them whatever those things are so that the the guide really walks you through like here are the five questions to ask yourself or your particular brand when building out your welcome flow here's how many emails should exist in your welcome flow we said typically say three to five um here are some basic elements that you can probably incorporate in your welcome flow so it could be like ugc and testimonials it could be Um, like unique value props about your product. It could be like product recommendations. Um, So it's really about here are the principles. Here's the, here's like a template. I use quotes there visually, Um, but also here's how to think about it properly to really be customized uh, for your brand. Hmm. Super, super interesting. Um, So, so, so really it's, it it is, it's, it's down to putting your, 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 your best foot forward and just, showing the benefits, social proof, and essentially proving that you're best at what you claim to be good at, essentially, you're in the right place. Right. Exactly. And then what is the objective of the welcome flow? the first purchase? Um, is it is it to trigger a first purchase or? Yeah, so your welcome flow, the sole thing is get get someone to try your product for the first time. You have an amazing product. Mm-hmm. You just want to get someone willing to uh, make that first purchase. And that might mean that they need to know the main benefit that you're going to deliver, handle some objections and also guide them towards selecting their first product. You know, especially if you're like an apparel store, for example, like something with like different Mm -hmm. types, Uh, maybe they're just a little overwhelmed by what product to choose. So that's going to be the first, um, the first step of the welcome flow. 
Okay. Okay. And how does a welcome flow differ from an AOV perspective? The, 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 this is a personal problem we're having in the sense that, um, we, we, we have a brand that has like a $150 AOV off the bat. No, there's just, just, it's just, it is what it is. Um, and then we're trying to, to get a more replenishable product at the $30 a month, um, you know, um, price point to, to integrate there. But you're speaking to two different mindsets, two different needs, essentially. Um, so, so how would you craft a welcome flow for a, for, for, for something that's going to be regular versus something that might be once a year, um, or, you know, um, biannual or, or even, you know, once in two years, what, what, how would you approach it? Essentially. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we really go always go back to the customer journey and the customer life cycle first. So it's like as a customer, what would I need? What am I struggling with in terms of deciding to make make this purchase? So typically for like high AOV purchases, let's say it's like a mattress or like a whatever whatever technology thing, like those are typically higher AOV, AOV purchases. You're maybe only buying once, or like even in the case where something might be bought two or three times in a year, usually your welcome flow needs to go a lot deeper into educating them about your product so you need to go a little bit more into here's how the product works here's the quality here are the different features but also how those features going to directly benefit you you might have a welcome flow that goes into like each of the features individually um, in separate emails and how it relates to what pain point it solves Um, you might need to do a welcome flow on like different customer personas and like how those customers would interact with your product because maybe people get different things out of your product Um, so it's a lot deeper Whereas uh, with lower AOB products, let's say it's just like an apparel store or like jewelry or something like that. Those ones are a lot broader, um, but typically where customers struggle is like choice fatigue. So a lot of those welcome flows are going to talk a little bit less about like deep diving on one particular earring. (laughs) It's going to be more about like, here's how to like navigate our store. Like here's how to choose like um, jewelry based on your skin tone or like your style. Here's different ways to wear our jewelry. It's really going to be about Mm helping to guide them towards their first purchase um so mm. again that's a super high level example but like that's typically it's like how deep do you go versus how wide do you go i love that i love that this is why i like bringing you on jess it's <laughs> that, that was great <laughs> insightful right there yeah good stuff good stuff good stuff and then the the browse abandonment um this is the creepy one you know um do you want to, uh, pers- this is anecdotal, obviously it feels creepy to me. Um, you've done an email capture and yeah, you, you don't think too much about the email capture and you're, you're browsing through, you know, a few products in the collection page and bingo, you're like, please come back. Is, is, is that it in a nutshell? What, what, how, how should you do it well without, without, um, giving the creepy vibes for, for browsing bad or med flow, at least to couldn't they? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd say like with the browse abandonment, consumers are a little bit more like aware these days. I think active on site is actually even creepier than browse abandonment because at least browse abandonment, they're like looking at a specific sure. product. Um, but again, it's really going to depend on um, the, the type of brand in terms of like, do you want to go deep on something or do you want to go a little bit broader? Um, with browse abandonment flows, typically it's pretty light um, in terms of like, hey, here's a product you were looking at. Um, first email is usually just a gentle reminder. And then from there you can, you know, potentially they're like, Hey, I'm, I've been looking at this product, but like, I'm not quite sure if this is like what I want. So you're recommending a few other products for them to decide on. Um, you can start handling some objections and so maybe like they need more testimonials to show that like customers love their product. Um, or maybe they need, um, a little bit more of a deep dive into like the product quality itself. Um, or mm-hmm. if it's like, you know, just reminding them that it's like, Hey, it's gluten-free keto friendly, like whatever those like mm-hmm. little icons and core value props are. Um, so with browse abandonment, typically we kind of think about like, if a cus- if you had a retail store and a customer was walking in, they were just kind of like scanning the store. What are some like, what would be like the random things like a, a store attendant might tell that customer? It's like, Hey, like just a reminder, our, our products are all keto friendly and like paleo friendly. Or maybe it's like, Hey, can I help you? And like, are, is there something in particular you're looking for? Like, are you looking for something that's for like dry skin? Here's some product recommendations mm. for you. Um, so just start thinking about like, again, what the customer mindset is 
in their browsing and why they haven't mentally locked on to a specific product that they're comfortable to, to purchase. Uh, and what what are the the trigger points for um you setting the intelligence in uh, i mean the copy intelligence and the browser abandonment flow um do you say okay if they have viewed this particular products um it would trigger brown um, browser abandonment flow one and then if it's this other set of products then it would trigger this flow or is it a single brow browser abandonment flow um that has sort of placeholders that cater to wherever they visited so it was, yeah yeah that's a good question so i'd say typically with smaller brands like if you're just starting out with getting a basic browser abandonment flow we always say just like just build one flow first like that's not over complicated usually it's two emails um you're going to use a dynamic product recommendation or product uh viewed block so it's going to dynamically show the products that the customer like viewed and then which product pages they viewed um and then we also at long play we use show hide blocks in clavio that mm. allows to show different information for different customer segments, but that's just the basics. And then from there, sometimes we'll segment off of like, are they a non-purchaser? Are they a returning customer? Um, you can segment off of the product type as well. Um, you can segment off of like, for example, if you have a quiz on your site, then you might show them different browse abandonments off of their quiz. But again, this is like a level of complexity that you get into as you go from a low seven figure to high seven figure to eight figure to nine figure these segmentations can get more complex, but first one, we always say just set it up with two, two to three emails max, um, and just get, get these emails going out. Just, just get the basics out there, right? Yeah. Get the basics out there. Okay. So what, wh why should you have, um, an add to cart flow and then an abandoned cart flow? What, what are the key differences and, um, yeah. Why, why should you have both? Yeah, um, so this is kind of a quirk of Shopify stores, which is obviously what most DC Pound brands are on now. Um, but your add to cart flow targets customers who add a product to cart, but don't start checkout. Um, whereas your abandoned cart flow only targets customers once they've actually clicked the start checkout button. They might have started entering billing details, but they didn't complete their order. So we find a lot of brands actually miss this add to cart flow. Um, and especially with like, I'd say fashion apparel, any brands where there's a lot of like similarity between things. Like, so for example, choosing between like a green t-shirt and a white t-shirt, it's all just preference. Um, we find a lot of people like shoppers can start using your add to carts as a wish list. Like I know that's how I browse uh, with when I'm like shopping on, on apparel stores. It's like, I have like a thousand dollars worth of things in my cart. Cause I'm just adding a bunch of things that I'm interested in. And I'm like, I'll sort through what I actually want to buy. Um, so without the add to cart flow, you're, you're missing out on that relatively warm buyer intent um, because they haven't actually started checkout yet. So they're not actually getting your abandoned cart flows. Mm -hmm. So you're interested in that. Yeah. So key difference is one, actually the, um, the abandoned, the, 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 the carts abandoned is to just recheck out and, you know, just drop off the back. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. Exactly. I'm going to skip the post purchase nurture flow. Um, also replenishment flow. It's, it's very self-explanatory. People should just buy the course, right? Um, D2C flow foundation guide. I'll, I'll link to it and, um, cross sell flow or ignore that, but the win back flow, do you want to speak to, um, the objective of win back flow and, um, just top level, um, first principles on, on setup? Yeah, definitely. So with your win back flow, these are really customers who they've made a purchase before. They could have made one purchase, they could have made three purchases, um, and they have not come back in a significant amount of time. Um, so the first thing we always say is like your win back strategy should start before you lose the customer, which means your post purchase structure flows, your replenishment flows, all of that is like quote unquote a, a win back strategy because you're preventing yourself from losing them. But by the time they get to a win back flow, it's like they've gone through all of this stuff and they're still not converting just off of like content or value props or relationship building. So win back flow is a little bit more of an aggressive um, retention strategy where you're typically throwing up some level of discounting um, and just getting them to, to come back. And again, from like a mindset standpoint, we always think about like what could get a customer to buy once, buy twice and not come back in a significant amount of time. And it could be like they're not seeing the benefits of the product. Uh, they switched brands. Um, they just completely forgot about your brand, like especially with the apparel companies, for example. They might have made like an impulse purchase on an Instagram story, and then they've just forgot. Like no one, no one's really keeping a mental track of like all the brands that they bought clothing from, right? So, mm -hmm. or maybe they are interested in some products, but they just haven't um, found ones that they loved. 
So your win back strategy is typically, again, more of an aggressive discount, typically like 20 to 25% um, off their next purchase. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really going to be around guiding them towards that next purchase that makes the most sense for them. So again, it's going to depend on how do you want to go broad? Do you want to go deep? Um, but custom product recommendations typically work really well there um, as well as like deep diving and like, Hey, th we were recommending this specific product for you because mm. it helps with these particular pain points. Mm -hmm. Okay. Figures really, really figures, which closes the loop on, on their um, CLTV and, and um, you know, repeat, repeat purchase. Okay. I think we've covered we've covered sufficient ground on 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 SMS on on email. I want you to quickly speak to to to, to SMS. Um, you know, don'ts first, and and then you know the the the, the must haves and the synchronicity between um, email and an SMS. So let's get started with with the importance of SMS. Um, what's the best way to start collecting, um, you know, SMS, um, just, um, sorry, um, cell, cell phone numbers. Yeah, for sure. Um, so with SMS, most brands launch SMS after they've launched their email marketing. So I would say like the best initial way to grow your SMS list is like through your email list. So obviously first step is like incorporating it into your uh, website pop-up. So the email capture pop-up that you're going to have on your site, AB test, having SMS in there, in addition to email, a two step, like AB test that, um, cause either way you do on your email address first, but that's gonna be the first step, but also driving email subscribers over to your SMS list. So you might mm -hmm. have in your welcome flow that your email welcome flow might say like, Hey, opt into our SMS list for an extra X percent off or an extra free gift. Um, you might also include SMS capture into your post purchase nurture flow. Um, you might include it into like cross sell flow, subscription upsells, things like that. Um, so mm -hmm. it's really about how do you use your email list to drive SMS list subscribers. And typically, um, good strategies are like SMS list subscribers get like early access to things. You get VIP perks, additional discount, whatever, whatever perks will, will resonate most mm -hmm. with your audience. Um, that's probably the most missed opportunity that we see is like people treating email and SMS as two separate channels. Again, retention mm -hmm. strategy is everything needs to be integrated. Um, so how do you leverage your email list to build your SMS list? Yeah. Um, yeah. Another you the, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go for it. Go for it. I'll, I'll, I'll hold the thought. <laughs> no, and I was going to say the second step, which is what you kind of brought up as well, is um, that email and SMS need to be integrated. So rather than we, with our team, we never say, what's our email strategy and what's our SMS strategy? We always say, what's our customer lifecycle journey? What messaging do they need to receive at what stage of the customer journey? And which channel makes the most sense for them to hear that from? Is email the best channel to deliver that information to them? Or is SMS the most important, the best channel to deliver that information to them? So very similar, but it's about flipping the script to back to the customer journey and the customer experience. Mm -hmm. I, it, it's is I, I like what you just said with regards to you know what is the right channel to to, to send the message. So the, the first question is what is the message, you know, and and then yeah. um, the second is where 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 do we sort of send the message through? So the point I was trying to, to 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 make, which which you probably you know mentioned, was more around um, incentivizing your customer base um, to, to 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 share their their cell phone numbers to opt into your SMS. Essentially, you mentioned many ways. One thing I was going to ask was more around loyalty programs. Um, do you give them more points for 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 opting in? Is is it is is that something you're seeing? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think and that's why like we love loyalty programs because it gives you so many like more leverage to pull when it comes to like incentivization. Leverage. So like rather than having to be like, hey, you get an extra ten percent off, it's like then you're just stacking discounts on discounts. Um, you can mm -hmm. say like you're gonna get a bonus hundred points, or you're gonna get two x points on your next purchase. Um, mm -hmm. Or like we're gonna bump you up a tier. Like you'd even say like get to skip a level. <laughs> I'm like I'm just making mm -hmm. things up now, but. Um, there's just so much, so many more uh, ways you can play around with it, but loyalty program and SMS is definitely like a great, uh, great integrated strategy for sure. Yeah. Funny you mentioned, I, I don't think many brands use the, the, you know, the benefits of their loyalty program as, as leverage enough, you know, as much as they should in, in their um, life cycle marketing campaigns. You know, there's so many ways to, to skin, you know, um, yeah, proverbial cats, but bullets. <laughs> interesting <laughs> stuff. Interesting stuff. And then, um, do's and don'ts of, of SMS. Um, what, what do you, uh, um, 
frequency and, and do's and don'ts. Um, how often should do do customers want to to hear from from you? How often should you message them? What should you be messaging them? And what what what, what absolutely shouldn't you be be sending to to customers via SMS? Yeah, yeah. So to, I mean, I, I'd say SMS is much more sensitive as a channel uh, than email. I realize it's a very generic or vague way to describe it, but we find like from a frequency mm -hmm. standpoint, it's a little bit more sensitive where it's like, if you could get away with three, three emails a week, you probably can't get away with three SMS a week. So it's usually less like a lower frequency than your email. Um, typically with like a million dollar brand, let's say um, we might say, start off with like one SMS every like two weeks. And then if it's still going well, then maybe one SMS a week. Uh, but you typically max out at like two SMS per week becomes like pretty aggressive. Um, if, you, if you're saying just like the number of times someone gets a text from you, obviously once you layer in a lot of segmentation and things like that, you can probably send a little bit more. Um, but like mm -hmm. a, a, an individual customer probably shouldn't be receiving more than two SMS from you per week um, unless they're like really, really bought into your brand. Um, and also from a, with, with SMS, there's so much, there's a lower character count. So you really have to be like very direct with your SMS. You can't be like typing essays. There's a little bit less like brandness that you can uh, incorporate there. Like if you say, I'll just get to the point. Um, but also we have been testing um, using SMS to deliver like more valuable content. So you might do like three tips for like your summer, like 4th of July celebrations. Um, mm -hmm. Something that's a little bit relevant of like, what would be a fun, useful text that you would get from a friend? Um, and that's very, very dependent on specific brands. Like you really have to, it really has to be like relevant uh, for your brand or else you're just kind of sharing random content. Um, but those are typically like high level tips that we uh, have seen work well uh, with SMS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very, very, very interesting. Um, and then in the world of direct mail really quickly, um, what, what, what are the, your, your, what, what are your guidelines your, your quick bulleted bullet point, you know, um, guidelines for, 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 um, for direct mail and when do you sort of bring that into the mix it seems like you start with email sms and then direct mail yeah exactly we usually do email sms and direct mail mostly because it's a probability of this channel working for this brand like email marketing kind of works for like every d2c ecom brand sms is like you gotta finesse it a little bit more and then direct mail you gotta finesse it a little bit more um and we always optimize of like what's going to get the highest ROI the quickest, and then can we build on the strategy? So that's why we do direct mail um, mm. last. But uh, with direct mail, I mean, one, most brands are not testing it as much as they should be. Um, and just definitely like run a test. Um, we're not saying direct mail is going to work for every single brand. It's really going to be dependent on your demographics. Uh, with us, with direct mail, we like to use it as one is actually quite effective as an, uh, as an acquisition strategy, um, post pilot and popular both, which is like our preferred platforms, both have um, pretty good, like kind of lookalike targeting type stuff. So it's a good thing to test in small batches. Um, we also use it for uh, retention and repeat customer stuff first. Um, so targeting customers who haven't come back in a, in a while, um, aren't super cold, but like it's probably about time for them to uh, come back. We'll use it to introduce new products. Um, we'll layer it onto like a, a promotion or product launch. So when we're doing a product launch, it's not just announcing the product, but like what's our email strategy? When do we want to layer an SMS? But also can we use direct mail to make sure that they're getting hit simultaneously um, and they're seeing your brand everywhere during a big promotion or during a big product launch. Um, we'll also use it to like get people to trial new products that they haven't tried, like cross-sell strategies. Um, but even like using things like a founder letter to build VIP um, kind of loyalty as well as like, it's so cool if you buy from brand and you get like a mm -hmm. handwritten letter from the founder um, saying thank you. So uh, those are a few just like top of mind uh, tests that we typically run with clients when we do drugs. Yeah. 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 And, and there are many other variables. I think we'll, we'll do a, we'll, we're going to, we're going to do a, a full direct mail sort of, um, yeah um podcast around it because there's so many variables to 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 work is it going to be a postcard are you going to send a flyer um as you said handwritten you know note from from, from the founder which would work how do you test how do you iterate you know, it, it, it there, there is you know devil in the detail there okay good stuff and then you you mentioned um repeat purchase apps i'm thinking tap carts for for like mobile apps um what, what are the repeat what are the must must have repeat purchase apps in in your stack? 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, tap card definitely. And then Rello and repeat. We also really like as well. Um, they're quite similar. Um, Rello has some really cool stuff around. Rello is a little bit better, um, with brands who don't necessarily have subscription. Like there's a little bit more you can still do there if you don't have a subscription product, whereas repeat mm -hmm. is really good for brands with subscription products. Um, mm -hmm. both are, um, have kind of like a magic cart, for example. So you're streamlining the actual purchase process so rather than recommending additional products. You can just drive them to a cart and a cart auto populates with like cross sell mm -hmm. items or upselling them to a subscription. Uh, they have like strategic timing type stuff. So like, uh, predictive timing in terms of like actually sending a reminder email at a time based on like the customer's purchase pattern and things like that. Um, so those are definitely two apps that we really like. And okay. I, yeah, honestly, okay. those are kind of the big ones. Okay. Um, why, why are quizzes, how do quizzes help with retention? Good question. So quizzes help with retention. And so I'd say actually it helps a little bit more with acquisition in the sense of turning uh, website visitors into first purchasers. Um, so mm -hmm. they, it helps reduce choice fatigue, helps guide the customer towards their first purchase. Those are the biggest two, um, two benefits with quizzes. Mm -hmm. And it also pro provides like additional customer data to in the future, uh, retain mm -hmm. customers a little bit more. So for example, with the skincare brand, you might have, um, you might have like 25 different products or even like a makeup company, right? Um, using mm -hmm. a quiz helps narrow down and simplify that purchase process where they can just plug in like, here's my skin type, here's what I struggle with, here's some pain points. Um, and you're recommending mm -hmm. three or five different products specifically for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, you have now also collected your customer data uh, as zero party mm -hmm. data. So now you know their pain points, now you know their skin types. Now you can build a post purchase nurture strategy very specific to here's different skincare tips for dry skin. And then also mm -hmm. now when you have your cross sell strategy, you can remind, you can cross sell them uh, products specifically for dry skin. Um, so that's a level of depth with a quiz. One, it helps them with their making the first purchase, but more importantly, you're also collecting zero party data to customize the rest of your retention strategy uh, for the customer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. I think we, we've covered a lot of ground from, from a perspective of retention marketing, I want to go back to, to email marketing and SMS and, um, your, 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 your platform backbone. Um, do you want to give a, a quick synopsis as to why backbone sort of simplifies or essentially helps smaller e-commerce teams streamline their, their email marketing? You, you mentioned about eight essential, um, email flows, and then many other sort of um, factors to, to to bear in mind, and many other layers to this. In 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 a nutshell, what what does Backbone actually? What value does Backbone give? Um, you know, smaller e-commerce operations looking to essentially get operate like 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 bigger, like like middle, like mid market, you know, e-commerce businesses out there. Um, yeah, I'll just hand it over to you with regard to that. Yeah. Um, so we're super excited about Backbone. So very excited to ch chat about it. Um, with Backbone, we really built it for that stage in building an e-com company where you don't have the time and expertise to manage your email marketing. So it's like you're a solo founder or you might have a marketing manager. Um, you don't, you're not, neither of you guys are really experts in email marketing. You're running a six or seven figure e-com brand and you are spread really thin. You're probably putting out fires and just trying to keep up every single day. So you don't have the time to sit down and be like, I'm going to learn about email marketing and I'm going to um, plan out our whole email marketing calendar. You're just kind of like trying to keep up. And you also don't have the budget to hire an email marketing agency. As we've talked about, you know, there's a certain scale where it makes sense for an agency to come in. And we found that this is the most challenging and also um, stressful place for an e-com uh, agency where you're kind of stuck. Um, like you need email marketing to grow, to e be able to hire someone to do email marketing, but you also don't have the time or the expertise to do email marketing yourself. And Backbone was really built for that. Um, so Backbone was really kind of built around the concept of like, you can't afford to spend hours a week on doing email marketing. How do we shortcut mm -hmm. this process for you? So with Backbone, um, you essentially come in, uh, we built five or six different algorithms that are really custom to how we think as an agency in building a strategy for email marketing or for, for an e-com brand. And as a brand, you can come in and um, plug in your brand details and you can generate 
an entire month's worth of email marketing campaign ideas, uh, flow recommendations in like literally seconds, um, as well as custom email templates for each of your emails in literally a second. Mm -hmm. And you can pass it off to us for us to design for you. And all of our users with Backbone, the, the main thing has been like, oh my God, this is literally saving me so much headache and so much time each week because I no, no longer need to go learn about email marketing. I don't need to hire an email marketer. I can run my email marketing in literally minutes. You can plan out a whole month mm -hmm. and generate all of your campaign topics, generate all of your email templates in you know a quick sit down. So that's really that was... what we, we built Backbone for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was blown away when I saw the demo. So you gave me you gave me early access to you, you should give give me a glimpse into into how the platform works. And um, I saw the 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 email calendar planner. Um, I saw the email layout planner. There was a flow recommendation. Actually, all the flows when you put in when you fill in all the the details of your your brand in there, it sort of recommends the flows, a number of um, you know emails on there there. And it, it gives you sometimes even email, you know, campaign recommendations like ideas, and and then I think the 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 the, the clincher for me was the fact that um you could export your Figma design, so you design your emails in Figma, and then um, you just import it there. Now, from from an ESP standpoint, um, you you obviously have support for Clavio, but beyond Clavio, do you what other ESPs do you integrate with? Yeah, um, Clavio and Sendlane are our top uh, recommendations when it comes to D 2 C ecom. Um, there's definitely other ones out there. We talked about OmniSend um, earlier today. Um, mm. There's Drip and things like that. But I'd say like Clavio and Sendlane are the ones that we feel comfortable um, backing uh, in terms of like mm. quality. And um, yeah, that's kind of where we would typically start. Um, and yeah, like when it comes to generating ideas and things like that, we have. Um, I always say with Backbone, because there's so many ESPs out there, we always say like Backbone is not meant to be another ESP. Um, there's enough ESPs out there. Um, mm -hmm. Backbone is really helping to replace the job of an email marketer. And our and our vision okay. with Backbone is to essentially do to email marketing what uh, uh, Facebook algorithms has done for Facebook ads and media buying. You know, back then in 2015, media buyers were like bidding and selecting audiences and doing all the manual strategic work. Um, Whereas now, based media buyers get to focus really on high-level creative and strategy. Um, and mm -hmm. same thing for Backbone. It's like we're automating the strategic thinking, and we've essentially taken all of our expertise as, a, as an agency, turned them into algorithms, so that we have a tool that can do the thinking of an email marketer for you. I noticed you didn't mention AI. We we are doing some AI on the back end. Um, I, my perspective on AI, I could probably do another whole podcast on that, but um, we've... <laughs> With our algorithms, uh, we focus on mach or algorithms first, and then we'll evolve it into machine learning, and then we'll evolve it into AI. Um, but we find that sometimes people throw in AI into tools when it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really, really, really interesting. I was blown away with with how um, it essentially replaces an email marketing um, executive, like an e email marketing manager or what have you, um, and how it just... You put in your brand details and bingo, you know, the entire framework, the strategy and framework is there ready as a template for you to implement. So you're plugging in to the system that sets it all up for you. And that would be hours, if not days of, you know, man hour work with regards to planning. So well done on that. Um, I believe you're, you're out of beta now with Backbone. Yes, we are out of beta. Yeah. Um, really excited. Just see, it's always exciting to build something and like have it come to life, and also seeing users um, using it and regularly. We have users who are jumping in it um, daily, and like jet, and like it's part of their workflow. We also have some users that we see jumping in one for a month. They do every all their work in a month in like one sitting, and then they come in um, again afterwards, uh, which is also cool to watch uh, as well. So I'm um, definitely really excited to to continue bringing on uh, more users and continue growing. Great stuff, Jess. Great stuff. So just want to thank you again for coming on, on the 2X e-commerce podcast. You're very active now on Twitter. Um, I will yeah. link to your, your, what's your Twitter handle? I will link to it though. Thank you. Uh, it's very new for me, um, but 
Uh, mm-hmm. My Twitter handle is Jess, J-J-E-S-S-C-H-A-N. Mm-hmm. So Jess Chan with two J's at the beginning. Got it, got it, got it. We'll link to it in the show notes. Um, but it's, it's it's always a pleasure, you know, catching up with you on, on the pod. Um, and um, for those who want to find out more about Backbone, it's just go backbone.co. So it's G-O-B-A-C-K-B-O-N-E.co. I'll link to it in the show notes. Um, your DTC flow foundation guide another very rock solid guide so, so i think for for brands as in they could pair up the insights from the d2c foundations guide um and you know plug all those insights into the templates and the structure set up by by backbone it's incredible how you've been able been able to move from from an agency to to to, to a solutions come to a SaaS solutions come even with the agency i think that's for another that's a, for another for another pod um, just the way you've built it out um, from a um, from from uh, with with the oh dear business operating Depends system well. yeah, yeah. B- BOS it, it's that in of itself is is worth you know worth talking into so people can get insight so so, so Jess always a pleasure to to connect thank you thank you so much for having me this was so much fun and I feel like we covered so many topics where we're like man we could go down a whole rabbit hole and do another hour long podcast just on this uh this like five second segment yeah yes yes I, I, I'll probably split it but no I'll, I'll, I'll push the, the entire episode out okay all right cheers amazing bye